Our scripture this morning is from Acts chapter 28, verses 17 through 31. Three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me, but I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. Not that I had any charge to bring against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They replied, we have not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of the brothers who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. But we want you to hear... But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. From morning till evening, he explained and declared to him, to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and the prophets. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would bless your word to our hearts this morning as we look into it and touch our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We're talking about goals this morning, and I apologize for my voice. This might help a little bit. Did you know that it's really common for people right after the attainment of a goal to go into depression? You know, we often don't think about that. But it's a common thing that after somebody works really, really hard for something, and then you finally get it, and then you just kind of go downhill from there. Um, And I don't know anybody who worked harder than Paul. For this goal to get to Rome. Or there's people who meet the goal and then it takes so much of their focus that once they get there, they're too tired to finish. They get there and then they give up. One example of that is it's a real common thing for, for pastors after a build, great big building project. They work hard, build a church, you know, build a building, get it all set up, and then they resign. <laughs> Often working towards a goal can take so much out of us that we just kind of give up. Others get really close to meeting their goals and then find a way to self-sabotage. You ever see people who get almost there, almost there, and then somehow shoot themselves in the foot and don't make it? Well, Paul didn't have any of these problems in reaching his goal, so I thought he would be a good example to follow. So what did he do 
um, to reach this goal and to do it successfully and to continue faithfully. Uh, number one, he didn't procrastinate. He didn't wait around. After all that he had gone through on the journey, he got right to it. Three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews. So he got settled in his own house, own rented house that he had the freedom to do, uh, chained to a soldier. And he got together with the leaders of the Jews. Three days. Um, I won't ask anybody to raise your hand, but I want you to think for a minute. Is there anything right now that you're procrastinating on doing? <laughs> maybe it's a great big goal. Or, you know, maybe it's just one of those things. And I've got those things too. You know, you look at it and you say, well, yeah, maybe tomorrow. <clears throat> Some of those things tomorrow has been going on for days and weeks and months. And I'll get to it one day. And sometimes it's just those little things even. Sometimes the bigger goals are easier to complete than the little ones. Because we think, ah, I can, I can afford to procrastinate because it's not that big of a deal. But Paul didn't procrastinate. Once he got there, he got started. To use a term we use today, he hit the ground running. He... He got right to it. Number two, he started with the right people. He started with the right people. And that's another thing that we often fail to do. You know, you see people um, <clears throat> in businesses and companies and at work complaining. But they're complaining just to have somebody have sympathy with them. They're not really talking to somebody who can make much of a difference. And, you know, you see the same thing sometimes in churches. People complain or something, but they don't really go to the right person where they can actually make a difference. And Paul knew who to talk to. He didn't whisper around. He didn't play politics to try to see, okay, who's on whose side here? He went to the leaders of the Jews in Rome, and he gathered them together out in the open. He wasn't subversive at all about it. And he called them together. He said, I want to, we need to talk about this. And the heart of the problem had to do with the Jews because the Jews in Jerusalem were, were the ones who didn't like what Paul was saying. And so they wanted him to have the death penalty. Um, so he tells them about that, but he starts with the leaders. He doesn't get everybody together. He starts with the leadership. So starting with the right people makes a big difference when it comes to reaching goals and, and to being effective once we have reached those. Number three, he told the right story. He told the right story or the right part of the story, we might want to say. We notice that he doesn't go back to his Damascus Road story here. He doesn't go back and say, you know, I was persecuting Christians and was on the road to Damascus and I saw the light. He didn't, doesn't do that here. They didn't really care so much about that. What they cared about is what's bringing you right here, right now, to go before Caesar, to be charged with the death penalty, possibly. And, you, you know, you're part of this new movement of Christianity. Why are you in trouble? So he explained that. Um, you know, wouldn't you love it if people you knew how to, uh, knew how to tell the, the right part of the story? Once in a while, or often, I'll do intakes in counseling, and I get all details way all around, way more than I ever want to know about things. But sometimes they miss the point. Sometimes the things we need to know get left out because there's too many other details or goes on and on. Where Paul doesn't go on and on. He just tells them the significant parts that they need to know. Sometimes it's said that less is more. You know, Abraham Lincoln is known for, for the quote, and I might not get it exactly right, 
He said, I apologize for writing you such a long letter because I didn't have time to write a short one. And there's, that's true. You know, it takes a little time and effort to boil it down to the essentials. And so that's what Paul does here. He just told them what they needed to know. And you know, I think as Christians, when we share our testimony with people, we have to look at that. You know, I don't know how helpful it is to say, I was three years old and I was a terrible sinner and I came to Jesus and he forgave me. That might be okay in certain situations, but they wanna know what God's doing in your life today, yesterday. They wanna watch you and say, hey, which part of the story is gonna affect me now? It's great that you went to church camp and got saved or that you accepted Jesus in Sunday school. We, we always want to celebrate that, but we might not, might not need to tell it at that point. And so Paul knows which the right part of the story to tell. He explained to them why he was in chains. <clears throat> Number four, his goal is anchored in Jesus. His goal is anchored in Jesus, even if not by name. He doesn't mention Jesus' name here. He says in verse 20, it is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. And Paul, Paul knows that if it weren't for Jesus, all of this would be just a waste of time. If it wasn't for Jesus, we might as well just go home. We might as well just let life take us wherever it goes and have as much fun as we can along the way. And in my opinion, you'll never have as much fun as you do knowing Christ. <laughs> you know, I've had more fun as a Christian than any other time. <laughs> but uh, Paul's goal is it's anchored in Jesus. Jesus is the hope of Israel and he's the hope of everybody. And some people don't know it. You know, they don't have hope, but they don't, there's barriers between them and Jesus. But whatever goal it is, and I don't know what goals you have today that you're working on, but Paul's goal was anchored in Jesus. Now, it doesn't mean that it has to be a real religious goal necessarily, but you know, Paul wasn't in Rome because it was something he wanted to check off of his bucket list. He didn't say, oh, I want, to, I want to go see Rome before I die just so I can experience that. No, he wanted to reach Rome with the gospel of Jesus. And, you know, goals that aren't anchored in Jesus are really just a waste of time. They just sort of fail or we get them and then they don't satisfy. Have you ever worked hard for something and then it didn't satisfy? That thing you just had to have and it didn't satisfy. And so you go chasing for something else. And you know, there's some people who live their whole life chasing for something else. You get this and you know, it's not as satisfying as you think. And so they go for something else. Goals related to Jesus are always satisfying. <clears throat> now they don't have to sound spiritual though. Don't over-spiritualize this, I don't think, because for a couple of examples, like financial goals. I think those can be very anchored in Jesus. I think it makes a difference if your finances are, are in order, you have a lot more peace in your life and you can serve Jesus a lot better, right? Um, I don't think it's unspiritual to wanna pay off your house or car. <laughs> you know, I think that could be a goal and that's related to Jesus. I hope that everything we do with our finances is related to life that we can live better for Jesus. That's, we're supposed to use them for his glory. And, you know, I think those are, those are definitely good. Uh, a retirement goal, maybe your goal is to save enough to retire or to retire at a certain age. That's, that's I think a spiritual goal, or at least it could be. Because then you have the ability to, to minister and not have to worry about, you know, getting a paycheck. 
And so that's a, that can be related to Jesus. And, you know, think how much more time, you know, you can have to impact the people that you love. And think about the people in your life who had time for you. Typically, our parents, when we're young, they're too busy, you know, scratching and clawing and trying to make life work to, to have a, a lot of extra time. But like grandparents, you know, they have time to go fishing or to sit down and talk or to do, to do fun things. Um, and so that can be a very important thing. You know, somebody can get to know Jesus or maybe a lot of people can get to know Jesus because you're retired. So it it's, definitely can be related to Jesus. Uh, giving goals, you know. I think it's exciting to set giving goals, we, goals that we want to we wanna give more to Jesus in one way or, or another. That's, that's some of the most exciting things that I've ever done is set, set some giving goals or savings goals. You know, you want to put some money in the bank. Not that you're trusting it instead of God, but, you, you know, life works better when you have a little bit of cushion. So they don't have to be spiritual sounding, but they can still be related to Jesus because if you're living for him, it all connects. Or career goals. You know, maybe you want to increase your sphere of influence. You want to climb up the ladder where you can affect more people. Or you can use your talents better. Maybe you want more earning power or more benefits. And all those can, can glorify God. You know, and, and I believe God wants his people in all sorts of positions. So... Again, that connects. Health and wellness goals. You know, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit and taking care of them is, is a, a faithful thing to do for the Lord. Um, hobbies. You know, it's okay to need refresh now and then. <laughs> to have something that gives you peace and is fun. And you know, a lot of times in your hobbies, you can, you can connect with people who you wouldn't have connected with otherwise. Maybe there's spiritual growth goals. Maybe you want to read your Bible more or, or improve your prayer life or, you know, know Jesus more. Attend church more regularly and get involved in an area of ministry. Any of those things can be goals. But the ones that are connected to Jesus somehow are going to be successful. And, you know, you can have goals at any day, any age. Little children can have goals, and we can have goals, you know, up to the last breath that we take. And that's all related to Jesus. To live life well and to honor him in every, every part of it is a wonderful thing. So there might be other goals you have, maybe personal growth goals. You want to, you know, you want to have more peace. You don't want to be so anxious. You want to be happier. You want to live more vibrantly. You want Jesus to radiate through you. You know, there's all kinds of goals, but if they're connected to Jesus, they're going to make a difference. Relationship goals. Somebody said one time, I don't remember, I'm terrible at remembering quotes, but somebody said one time that if Christians could live out the biblical view of marriage and family and relationships, you couldn't keep people away. You know, if our relationships could be as good as God wants them to be, people be running because they need help. So relationship goals are a good thing. So all of these things can be tied to Jesus. You know, when you love your family, you love them for them, but I hope that you do it with the power of Jesus and for his honor. Because we glorify God when we do those things. Number five, he listened. He listened. And by so doing, he gained an audience and he earned the right to speak. You know, we're not very good at this as a culture. Usually when somebody's talking to us, we're thinking of what we're going to say in reply instead of actually just listening. Sometimes if you can just listen. Paul didn't know where these guys were at. 
He just listened to them. And then they invited him to speak. And, you know, that's, a, uh, that's always a goal uh, that's beneficial. And I've gone through multiple times in my life. It's like, okay, I'm going to spend a week. I'm going to try to become a better listener for this week. One time I was in a spiritual disciplines class, and we had to do the discipline of silence for three weeks. Um, I made a few mistakes with that. Uh, and the, the way that you did it is you only said exactly what you had to say, abs- what was absolutely necessary. And, you know, in a spiritual discipline, kind of like giving, don't let the right hand know, let the left hand know what the right hand's doing. And so I didn't want to tell anybody, and, hey, here am I, I'm practicing the discipline of silence. So I didn't tell anybody, so people thought I was mad at them because I wasn't talking. So I did learn that, you know, hey, uh, maybe it's not bad to give people a heads up. But it was a good experience. I realized how many times that maybe I didn't need to say something. And being a good listener, and you know what, I'll tell you a secret. You don't even have to be very good at it to be way above average. (laughs) It's a gift that you can give people, is the gift of listening. And we just are not good at it as a culture. So even if you're not so good at it, you know, you're still probably above average if you're working on it. So Paul listened. They wanted to hear what his views were. Number six, he was patient. Isn't there that balance between procrastination and impulsivity? Either we put it off or put it off, or maybe we do both. Have you ever done this? You put something off, you put something off, you put it off for days, weeks, months, and then all of a sudden, it's got to get done now. Paul avoided both of those extremes. He got to it right away, but then when he met with the leaders... It says here, uh, they arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers. It probably wasn't real close, or Luke would have said, you know, within two days they brought somebody. It may have been a week or so. Paul wasn't going anywhere. He was chained up in his house. And so he waited patiently. And boy, that's hard, isn't it? Waiting sometimes is the most difficult thing that we do. And to just wait, knowing that God has the timing in his control. I think that's, that's the big thing there. Paul knew that God had brought him this far. He was going to keep working. And so he, he could afford to wait because he was on God's timetable. And sometimes we have to readjust our timetable to God's timetable. And I think that's where patience comes in. Number seven, he was willing to sacrifice. He was willing to sacrifice. When they came, it says, he spoke from morning to evening. That would be a sacrifice. To speak and to essentially preach from morning till evening. But he did that. And... I doubt if Paul's health by this time is really, you know, vibrant and strong. But he was so passionate, he finally got the chance to do what he wanted to do, to speak to the Jews in Rome. And so he, he was willing to sacrifice. And you know, any goal that's worth achieving is going to take some sacrifice, isn't it? The way I like to define sacrifice is... Giving up things you love for things you love more. Giving up things you love for things you love more. How many of you love to sleep in? Okay. Well, this morning you gave that up because of something you love more. Worshiping Jesus and coming to church, right? That's a sacrifice. It's hopefully not too painful of a sacrifice. But... We make sacrifices for things that are important. If you've ever done athletics, you know that, you know, you just don't show up and automatically things come out easy. No, your whole life gets focused around that. And, you know, even like, for example, in our music, we know we got to practice. 
It takes time. It takes sacrifice to, to improve in anything that you want to do. And so uh, he was willing to sacrifice. If you want to be good within your family, whatever your role is, it takes some sacrifice, doesn't it? You have to do some things that maybe aren't fun. If you're taking care of your family and you're, you know, you're doing your role, it's going to take some time, it's going to take some effort, but the benefits are wonderful. So whatever it is, it's worth doing. You know, Jesus went to the cross for us. And we say we want to be like him. So to follow him, it's going to mean some sacrifice. But you know what? I'll tell you something. It's always worth it. It's always worth it. Don't forget about heavenly rewards. They're waiting for us up there. Paul was willing to sacrifice because he could see beyond the present situation. Then number eight, he used a trusted source. He used a trusted source, the law and the prophets. Because these people were Jews and he wanted to show them that Jesus was predicted and Jesus was just a continuation of what they believed, he used the law and the prophets to explain to them about Jesus. He didn't go back and describe the resurrection and talk about how many people saw Jesus after he had been resurrected. They weren't so concerned with that. They wanted to know, is this biblical, essentially? Is this biblical? And Paul showed them and proved to them from the scriptures. A trusted source. And he started with them where they, needed, where they were, not where they needed to be. You know, he realized where they were. And, you know, we have to do that. If we're going to help people come to Christ, we have to start where they are, where their understanding is, and try to work with that to help them see Jesus. And number nine, he followed through. He followed through. He didn't stop short. He didn't just say the nice, easy stuff. He said some of the hard stuff, too. It says here, some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. So this is the statement that he followed through on. He says, the Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through the prophet Isaiah, go to this people, you will be ever hearing but never understanding, and basically that you're going to harden your heart, and therefore God's going to open up the gospel to the Gentiles. That was the, that was the part that they didn't want to hear. The truth that they had hardened your heart have you had, ever had anybody tell you you had a hard heart or that you were going someplace sinful or that you were, you know, hey, I'm worried about your brother. I'm worried about your sister. It doesn't seem like you're serving Jesus. Like, you know, I see some problems. That's not comfortable, is it? But, you know, I thank God for those people who do it in love. I mean, there's always those who are just judgmental. But he told them the truth, that their hearts were hardened as predicted. And then he also told them the truth that God allowed all people to have access and opportunity to become the people of God. They didn't like that either. They lost their exclusive status as God's people. If anybody could be God's people, well then, we're not special anymore. Jealousy is alive and well, isn't it? And that's basically what was going on here. But, you know, Paul didn't stop short. He, he declared that. And you know what happened? Some left, but it says that he continued. He stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ for two years at this point. May have been more. But when Luke finishes writing Acts, it's two years, he's, he's preaching the gospel and he keeps doing it. I don't know what goals you have in your life. Sometimes we don't even think about them, but I think it's worth having them. You know, instead of just sort of wandering through life where 
it takes us. I believe God has a plan and God has some goals for each of us. And he wants to help us achieve them. Maybe you already know what they are or maybe you're waiting for them. And it's okay. You know, there's times we might wait for a long time. <clears throat> Lord, what do you want me, where do you want me to go from here? The path kind of seems wide open. So maybe you're waiting on there, those, and that's okay. But maybe you already have some, and, you know, <clears throat> you want God's help in, in accomplishing those. Look at these things. Don't procrastinate. Start with the right people. Tell the right part of the story. Anchor it in Jesus. Listen to other people. Be patient. Be willing to sacrifice. Use trusted sources and then follow through. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the ultimate example that you followed through with your goal of dying for our sins on the cross. And we thank you for Paul's example. And God, we thank you for the examples of those around us who are living vibrantly for you. God, I ask for each person here, Lord, that you would help us to reach our goals and even more than that, to reach your goals for us, Father. I pray that those would be one and the same and you would empower us for that, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.